why should you take advanced database systems? Um, so I say this every year, and every year this continues to be true. Um, and that is that database system developers are in high demand in industry and also in academia. I can't get enough of them either. But the, the feedback that I continually get from people in industry is they want people that know how to work on complex systems, in particular database systems. Uh, and so if you take this class, we will teach you how to write high performance and correct code in, in the context of a, of a modern database management system. And so a lot of the lessons you will learn from this class can then be extrapolated and extended to other areas of computer science and other areas of systems, right? So people that can work on database systems are in high demand because they have to really think about hard problems in, in complex software. And if, you, you know, if, you, if you're good at doing database systems, you can then apply that knowledge to other areas, right? If you're just a JavaScript programmer, they're not going to hire you to work on a, on a database system or they're not going to hire you to work on an OS kernel. But if you can do, you know, embedded systems, database systems, operating systems, you can do um, pretty much anything. So that's the one thing I, I hope you get out of this is that this is not, things we're going to talk about here are not just only for database systems. We're doing it in the context of database systems, but it will be uh, applicable to uh, a bunch of other things. And just to sort of tout uh, or show you why this is true, I just want to give a, a roster of Previous students that have taken this class or have worked with me, uh, I hid their identity um, for the request. But these are just a sampling of some of the students that have been working with me on the system that you guys were working on in this class. And they have all been gobbled up by various database vendors and major uh, software companies to work on database things. Right? So, again, some of these students are, are in the room right now, but we can ignore that now. But, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll continue to say this throughout the semester, the one thing that every single database company emails me and asks me uh, if they have any students that work on uh, a particular area is the query optimizer. So this will be a really difficult thing to discuss, but if you get really good at query optimization, you will have no problem finding a job for the rest of your life. At least five years, I suppose. Okay? <laughs> All right, so what are we going to discuss today? Uh, we're going to talk about the wait list, because I'm sure that's what a lot of you care about. Uh, then we're going to talk about the course outline, what the course will be about, and then I'll finish up the latter half with sort of my crash course or introduction to the, the history of database management systems, at least going back to the 1960s, okay? So I say this every semester, and I try to get better, but it never happens. Um, I, I get excited when I talk about databases, and I start talking really fast. So if you have a question and you don't understand what I'm saying, just raise your hand, Tell me to stop, shut up, and slow down, and I'll repeat myself. Uh, I'll try to keep talk slowly, but again, as I said, I get excited. Um, and the other thing, too, is I won't answer any questions about the material that I'm discussing in the lecture uh, at the end of the class. So if you have a question and you, and you try to wait to the very end and you try to come up and talk to me at the very end, say, what about slide, whatever, I'm not going to answer it because I'd rather you stop me during the lecture and say, well, this doesn't make sense, or what about this? Because if you have a question, then somebody else probably has a question, and the things we're going to talk about are actually are really difficult, so it's important to make sure you guys understand, because otherwise I'm just going to keep on going. So I didn't do this before, and I found out the hard way that, again, there's a lot of you that are shy or worried about, I'm going to be upset that you ask a question. It's not true. So don't wait to the very end. If you have a question as we go along, just tell me to stop, and I'll repeat myself. Okay? All right. So the wait list. Uh, currently, we have... Uh, 73 people on the waitlist as of this morning. The max capacity of this course is 40. I'm capping at 40 because that's the largest I can go and maintain the quality and the kind of hands-on uh, collaboration that I can have with you during the semester. Going beyond this, it's simply not going to be able to scale. So uh, there are currently 28 people enrolled in the course, and there's, that means there's 12 free slots. And so what we're going to do is, in order to be fair to everyone, and make sure the people that really want to take this course can get in this course, uh, we'll be pulling people off the wait list in the order that you, feed, that you complete the first assignment and get 100%. The first assignment has been posted on the, the website a few hours ago or an hour ago. Uh, I won't talk about it in this class, uh, but we'll, have, we'll talk about it in the next class. But if you want to get started and get working on it now, uh, Prashant and I will be able to help you out in, in Piazza and get started. Um, you, 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 you can start this today. Autolab is set up. Everyone on the waitlist and the enrollment 
has been registered into the class on Autolab. We just haven't turned on the submissions for the first assignment, and we hope to do that either today or tomorrow. When you, all the code is available on GitHub now, you can get started on the first assignment immediately. Okay? Any questions about this? Okay. All right, so what is this course about? Right? Obviously, the, the, the title is Advanced Databases. Um, but that can go a bunch of different ways, and this, you know, in particular, I'm, I can, I'm concerned about the database internals. So this is a course about how to build a modern database management system. Um, so we're going to understand uh, you know, what are the main concepts and what are people doing in state-of-the-art systems today. But as a larger theme, we're also going to uh, learn about how to write uh, high-quality code in a complex uh, software system. Right? And in context of databases, we don't care. We, we not only just care that it's that the code is fast, we also care that it's actually correct. Um, so we're going to learn how to, how, to, how to handle that. You guys learn how to write proper documentation, uh, write good testing or good test cases. Uh, for all the, the third project, you do code reviews, and we'll learn how to do that. And then just in general, since the system you'll be working on is a really large code base, and a lot of people that wrote some of the pieces you'll be maybe modifying aren't here anymore, right? Which is, you know, totally how things are in the real world. Uh, hopefully you, you'll get some insight and some experience on doing this, right? So I, I, I'll say this before throughout the semester, but I always, when I first started teaching this course two years ago, I asked all my friends in database companies, like, what's the one thing you want me to teach students? Like, you know, do you guys, you guys want me to really cover locking? Do you want to cover indexes? Like, what's the one thing that you want a student that takes my class come out and have, have a certain skill in? And without me prompting either of them or telling them what, you know, one company said versus another, they all basically said the same thing. They said they all wanted students that knew how to work on a large code base independently, right? And get started off, get, get running away. So there's not something, you know, you can teach somebody to do this. It's something you learn over time and, and get better at. All right, so the scope of the course will be that we're going to be covering single node in-memory database systems. So this is a, not a course on distributed databases. The reason is because, one, our database is only single node, not distributed, so there's that. Um, but I really want to think you can, there's a lot of important problems you have to solve first on a single node system um, before you want to go distributed. Right? Just because you're running on multiple machines, if, you're, if you have a crappy single node system and you make it distributed, then you have a distributed crappy system, right? So we want to make sure that the single node thing is high performance and correct first before we scale it out. And I think there's a lot of interesting uh, topics in this area, and that's what the course we focused on. I'll say also, too, that everything we're talking about here for the most part, will not be found in a textbook. Right? This is a graduate level, PhD level course. So we're talking about state-of-the-art topics. Right? So if you took the intro class last semester, uh, I would consider that a sort of a classical database system course. Right? We teach about buffer pools. We teach about the architecture from the 1970s, 1980s. The things we're talking about here, although it builds upon those topics, uh, are you know, things you're going to do if you're going to build a brand new database system today. What would you have? So the topics that we're going to cover are concurrency control, indexing, uh, both latch-free and with, with locking and latching, storage models, compression, system catalogs, parallel join algorithms. A new topic for this semester will be networking protocols. How do you actually have the data system talk to other database nodes, or how do you have to talk to the client? Uh, logging recovery, query optimization, compilation, and execution, and then running database systems on new hardware. So I will say that the focus of this semester versus previous semesters will be heavily skewed toward uh, this topic here, in particular, code compilation and, and query gener or code generation, right? Because now the new database system, or our database system that, we're, that we've been building here at CMU, that you would do all your projects on, it's now based on the LLVM. So that means that instead of interpreting the query plan like we did in the classic database course, we're actually going to generate code on the fly for the query plan, compile that into machine code, and execute that. And we do this for performance reasons. So the part of the reason we decided to do this is because the feedback that I've been getting about the previous course, it has been, it's been way too easy, right? So uh, in, on the 4chan message board, somebody posted a question, hey, uh, do you know any source where I can learn relational database theory really easily? Thanks in advance. And then I don't know who this person is, but he decides to chime in, like, yeah, CMU has a course. Uh, the beginner course only has a bunch of slides, but the advanced course, I mean this class, but it's not that advanced, uh, is the place to go if you want to get full lectures on YouTube. So that hurt. 
And then a few days ago, somebody on Hacker News uh, posted the last year's course uh, on, on Hacker News. We made the front page. And someone's like, yeah, thanks for doing this. This would be really useful to train junior programmers. And this guy's like, do you really want to start juniors with this? And he said, yeah, sure. This doesn't require any degree. doesn't require any work experience. So this should be easy, right? So we decided to have you guys work more on the LLVM stuff part of the system, because that's more complex. And this is definitely where the industry is going and, and applying this, this, this query compilation uh, technique. So don't worry if you haven't taken a compilers class. I haven't either, and I don't care so much, right? It's, it's really about how can we use the LLVM and query compilation and code generation in the context of a database system, right? And if I can understand it, then you guys can understand it. OK, so what kind of background are you going to need? As I said, already said, you don't need to have uh, taken a compilers course. We will cover all the things you need to know about LLVM uh, in order to do the projects. Um, but I'm going to assume that everyone here has taken some kind of basic intro database class either 445 from last semester, or if you're, if you're a graduate student, you've taken uh, a database course at your, at your undergrad institution, right? So the reason why you need to have this background is because we're going to discuss the modern implementations, the modern variations of classical database you know, implementation algorithms, right? So I'm not going to teach you what a hash join is or what a grace hash join is. I'm going to teach you the Radix hash join, the more modern parallel version of it. Right? So you sort of need to understand the fundamentals and understand the more complex topics. So with that said, the things I'm not going to cover are SQL, serializable th serializability theory. So everyone should know what conflict serializable is versus view serializable. Uh, I'm not going to teach relational algebra, the basic algorithms, as I said, the joint algorithms, sorting algorithms, things like that. And then the basic data structures. Right? Everyone should know what a, a B plus tree is and should be able to implement one. Okay? All right. So the background from a technical side, from a programming standpoint, all the projects you would do in this class will be done in C++11. I'm not going to teach you C++11, right? If you ever should know C or C++. Uh, and everyone should, be, should know how to debug a multi-threaded C++ program, right? You should know how to plop it down to GDB or whatever the one is on the Mac and step through uh, the frames and try to see what's going on. So the first two projects in this class can be completed entirely with using GDB as your, as your debugger. For the third project, since it's you guys choose what you want to do, if you start mucking around in the LLVM, LLVM engine code, then <coughs> GDB is not going to be your friend because what will happen is if you have a seg fault, you don't land with a nice, st nice stack trace in GDB, you land in assembly. And you have to reassembly to try to figure out what's going on. Now there's enough uh, components in the system that aren't written in the LLVM stuff, where you don't have to worry about this. Uh, Marcel's here, and he's been working on a tool that allows us to step through the LLVM IR to make it easier to understand what's going on. But I just, just want to emphasize that this is a programming-heavy course. This is a systems-oriented uh, course. So you should be prepared to deal with bugs in your C code. Okay? All right, so let's talk about logistics now. Uh, all the course policies and the schedule are been posted on the course website. And I don't, I hate to have to say this every single time, but please read the CMU academic uh, honesty policy. Um, if you're doing something that you don't want to, maybe not sure whether it's the right thing to do, please contact me, because I'd rather have you ask me say, hey, we found this code on the internet, can we use it? I'd rather have you ask me to say whether that's the right thing to do or not, than me find out that you cribbed last year's assignments or stole code from someplace that we shouldn't have taken code from, and then not, I have to go to Warner Hall and report you, okay? So I'm very serious. Please don't plagiarize because it makes my life harder and I will destroy you. Okay? All right, now office hours. Uh, I'll have office hours on Mondays and Wednesdays in my office right before class. I'm up on the ninth floor. The things you can talk to me when you come to office hours, because I bring this up, because every year kids come and talk to me about whatever they want, because they, they think I'm young or they think I'm street or whatever. Um, <laughs> so we can talk about problems in your projects. Uh, I, I, you know, I have a pretty good understanding of how our system works. There's some corners that I maybe mean, I don't fully understand, but I can at least sit down with you in GDB and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, if you have questions about any of the papers, if you guys assigned to read in the class, we can discuss those. Um, and because I've had students come to me when their girlfriends break up with them or boyfriends break up with them, I can give you tips on how to set up your account <laughs> on Tinder or Bumble or Grindr, whatever you want, um, and you know help you be successful in, in that aspect of your life. Okay. <laughs> All right, so the, we have one TA for this uh, course. His name is Prashant. Uh, he's not here right now. He'll be back on campus later in the week. 
He's a third year PG student in the CS department of me. I co-advise him with Todd Mowry. Uh, he did his bachelor's and master's at the University of Toronto and then spent some time at IBM before he showed up here at, at CMU. So he is the lead architect and the sort of main developer now on the Peloton database management system. And he was the main designer for the LLM engine that you guys be working on on the first project. Um, so he can pretty much ask, ask you can, he can answer any question that you may have. And he's, he's ridiculous, he's amazing. Um, I, I stand by my, my last statement there. Um, and again, he and I will be answering questions on Piazza and he'll have office hours that we'll post as well. All right, so what's expected of you for the course? Uh, so there'll be reading assignments, programming projects, midterm, final exam, and then extra credit. So we'll go through each of these. So for every class, if you look on the schedule, I'll have a bunch of papers. And the paper at the top will have a little star next to it, and that's the required reading. So before class, you're required to read that paper and then submit a short synopsis or summary to me on a Google form, right? And the summary can basically be one paragraph. We just basically say, here's what the paper was about. Here's the system that they used or modified to uh, evaluate their claims in the paper. And here's the main contributions of that. And then what was the workload that they ended up using, right? And this, this last one is important because we have a benchmark framework that you can use in Peloton uh, for your third project. And it's, you want to understand what are the different workloads you want to use to evaluate your project at the end, right? If you're doing something uh, for analytical queries, you don't want to run TPCC, you want to run TPCH. So you have to get a feel for what people are actually doing in, in these research papers to evaluate their ideas in their database systems based on, on this last one here. And so this link here is posted on the mm -hmm. website. Uh, this will take you to a Google form and you just select the, the date, put in your Android ID, um, and then copy and paste your, your summary in. Again, as I said before, please don't plagiarize. I will, we, we do check, right? Uh, CMU has a nice tool that makes, makes this all happen very easily. So just don't copy the, the text from the paper and plop it in. Uh, don't find another summary that somebody may, somebody may have written in another class in another university and copy their summary in, right? Again, if you have questions about whether, whether you're, you're doing the right thing, please, please ask me, okay? I'd rather just, you know, you and I hash it out rather than have to go report you. Now, as, as I alluded, all the programming projects in this course will be based on a new open source database management system we've been building here at CMU for the last couple of years called Peloton. Um, Peloton is an in-memory hybrid database management system. So in-memory means that the primary storage location of the database is entirely in memory, right? Contrast this with last semester, if you took 445 or 645, where that was a disk-based database system where the primary storage location of the database was on disk, right? and you copy things into memory as needed. With, with this system, the database starts off in memory, right? and if you need to, you don't support this yet, but you could flush things out the disk that you don't need anymore. Right? So as I said, this is a modern code base. It's based on C++11. It's multi-threaded. We use the LLVM to do query compilation and code generation, um, and we, we speak the Postgres wire protocol. So you can open up the Postgres terminal just as you normally would on your laptop, and you can connect to, uh, to the database system. So again, this is a research project that we're doing here at CMU, but we actually try to spend time to do high quality engineering to the best that we can, and because we want this thing to end up being usable outside of CMU. So we actually just hired a full-time uh, staff member and an engineer last month, who's now gonna be helping with us, you know, sort of um, make the code cleaner and more solid and, you know, and, and actually usable outside of us. So for your projects, you'll be able to do all your development on your local machine. Peloton builds on Linux, and then as of uh, last year, it now builds on OSX. Uh, there's instructions on the website how to do this. You gotta make sure you have the right version of Xcode. Uh, one student last year got to sort of compile on Windows 10 with the new uh, Linux uh, package or component you can install. I don't recommend that. We haven't actually tried to do it, doing it. Um, but if you don't have one of these platforms, we'll provide you with a Vagrant VM. If you don't, Vagrant is basically a wrapper around VirtualBox, so we give you a little Vagrant file, and there's like one command that'll automatically download, and install, and set up a virtual machine for you. And it'll have all the dependencies you need to actually develop Peloton on your local machine. When it comes to do time to do benchmarking in uh, Project 2 and Project 3, we have a cluster of machines that were donated to us by MemSQL, which is an uh, in-memory database company, and we'll provide instructions on how to log into these guys and, and run them. Right, these will be, I think, two socket, dual socket machines with like 120 gigs of RAM. So these will have much more memory than your laptop. And if you want to run uh, you know, performance profiling and other more complex experiments, you can use these. 
So we have some uh, additional materials also provided us uh, uh, later in the semester, and that's a contribution from our friends at Snowflake Computing, Snowflake DB. All right, so the first two projects, uh, what we're going to do is provide you uh, with the test cases and the scripts and everything you need to evaluate your first pr programming assignments. You'll submit these on Autolab, it'll do the auto grading, and then, and then spit back whether you succeeded or not. Um, for project one, this will be done individually. And the reason is because we want everyone to get, you know, get their hands dirty working on the database system uh, and understand you know, how to build it, how to run it, how to test it. Um, but for the second project, it'll be groups of three. So you start when you start thinking about now who's in the course and who do you want to buddy up with. Um, because for the second pro the second project will be handed out, I think, in two weeks. And then for the third project, that'll also be a group project. And usually what happens is the the people you do project two project two with, you end up doing project three with. Last year we had somebody who had a fight with somebody else because they didn't they didn't shower enough. So I had to break them up. If that happens, we can we can make we can, we can figure it out. But in general, you want to pick the right people for project two because that's the people you want to work on project three. Okay? So so project one, as I said, it's out now. Again, if you're, if you're on the wait list, this is how you get enrolled, right? by finishing this with 100%. Um, the basic idea is that you need to implement three string functions, SQL functions, in the database system, right? Upper, lower, concat, right? They, they pretty much sound exactly what they sound like, right? Um, and again, this is not meant to be really hard. Like, it's, you know, it's not hard to write the upper function. It's really how do you connect the pieces from the catalog and the binder to the, the code generation portion to the actual C++, C++ implementation of the string functions. So the website provides details on how to do this. Um, I'll talk about more about it on Monday next week in class. But then also there'll be a special one-time recitation on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Uh, on the ninth floor. Where we'll go into more details about how to actually do project one. Because right, we recognize that this is a, a you know big piece of software we're throwing at you guys for the first first assignment. So Prashant and I will show you exactly how how it all fits together and all works. So I'll, I'll send a reminder out about this on Piazza. And again, please don't plagiarize because it makes my life harder and it makes your life terrible. Okay. All right. For Project Three, um, as I said, this will be a uh, open-ended group assignment where you're basically going to pick a group of three people. And you're going to propose to build some new component in the database, this database system based on the things that we discussed in the class. Um, so this will be a, a major programming assignment. I think it's 40% of your grade. Um, and you will want, you know, be working on through this for, for at least half the semester. And so instead of just getting writing a bunch of code and then throwing it at us when, when you're done or, or just leaving it up on GitHub and never actually doing anything with it. The goal is that your third project, you want to get this merged into the core database management system. So we're about 50% success of uh, success rate of getting students' projects merged into our, our main system. So uh, you don't worry about this just yet. I'll, the, the, the class right before the, the spring break, I'll spend time discussing different projects, uh, topics you could pursue. I'm also available to talk about the kind of things we, we're interested in. I think I sent an email out about doing research on this, this area. Right, so we can pick a project that might be end up turning something to a paper later on if you're if you're if you're interested. Okay, All right. So what you end up for project three, you have to do a proposal and that'll be done in class. You do another uh, presentation where you say this is the, this is our current status of the code. Um, you'll do two code reviews during the semester where you'll be paired up with another group and you'll review their code on GitHub and provide feedback to them, and then I'll sort of monitor this, make sure you you know you're doing things correctly. And then you have a final presentation, and then I don't give you a final grade. I won't give you a final grade unless your code can cleanly merge into the master branch on GitHub. And depending on whether we merge it or not is, is, is depends on how well that your code is. Um, for the project proposal, again, this will be five. I'll cover this when we get closer to it. But this will be five minute presentation, and you just describe what you're actually going to have to do to actually modify the Peloton system to actually do your to do your implementation. And then the status update, basically the same thing. What's going on? What, how, how, how are you making out? And there's anything that changed in your in your plans? But then for the code reviews, again, you'll be paired up with people uh, that are in the class, and you'll review their code, they'll review your code, and you provide feedback for them. And this is important because when you go out in the real world, it's not like you just write code and just you know merge into willy nilly. You are going to have to make sure that your code is up to a certain standard and high and quality, and other people are going to check this for you. So you want to learn how to how to do this. Okay. Again, for the final presentation, 
uh, be 10 minutes on the last day of class. So we'll have a scheduled final exam. I don't know the date yet, but give it to us in, later in the semester. Uh, the final exam will be actually be on the last day of class. The, the final exam that we're, the, the day during the finals week, that's when we'll have pizza and a presentation uh, demo session to talk about everything. And again, the, I won't give you a final grade unless everything can cleanly merge the master branch and everything's commented and everything's cleaned up nicely. All right, so any questions about project three? We'll cover this more uh, as we go further along in the semester. All right, so I previously only did a final exam, uh, one exam during the entire semester for the last two years. The feedback I got every year was it'd be really nice to have a midterm exam. Um, that way they have a sort of checkpoint to understand what these exams look like and, and not wait until the, the very end. So on the last day of class before spring break, it'll be Wednesday, March 5th, we'll have an in-class midterm exam that covers all the, the topics we've covered up, uh, we've discussed up until that point. Um, and this will be like a long form question, like in, in multiple choice. Right? I'll ask you high level questions about the, the core ideas that we talked about during, during the semester, not like, did this paper say this, right? We're not gonna do stupid things like that. It's more like the conceptual questions I care about, okay? And then for the final exam, instead of having that in class, that'll be a take, take home written exam. Um, and this will be, be all long form questions, not multiple choice. And then you'll have to turn it in when we come to the, uh, when we come to the final presentation day during finals week, okay? So another thing that uh, I'm offering this year also is extra credit. So we have a online encyclopedia. I've been working on this for, for three years now. We finally outsourced it to some guy in Brazil. So it's actually written and, and it works. We just have to put it up. Uh, so we have a website that's essentially trying to be the Wikipedia of database, of database management systems. So we're calling it the database of databases. Uh, and so you can get extra credit 10% in the class if you write an, a, an article about a particular database system of your choice. Um, so I'll provide more details about this later, later in the semester, um, but just pick whatever data system you're interested in learning about, and then you just end up writing a sort of a quasi-academic style article about it. And so what, what I'm doing differently than what, what Wikipedia does, like Wikipedia just has a freeform text field, you can write any text you want. My system is actually semi-structured, so like for concurrency control, you, you select whether it has two-phase locking or OCC and things like that, and then you can write a paragraph about what it's about. So it's not freeform text, it's, it's more structured. And again, please don't plagiarize, right? Yada, yada, yada. Okay. So the, the breakdown for the grade would be 10% for reading reviews. The first project is only 5%. Again, it's not meant to uh, really, really stress you out. It's just meant to you know, have you get understand what the code looks like and how it works. Project 2 will be 25%. Project 3 will be 40%. And then the midterm and final will be 10% and 50%, uh, respectively. Okay. So the, uh, all the discussion for the class, the projects, the assignments, everything will be done on Piazza. Uh, if you have a technical question about the project, like even if it's like my code doesn't compile, I don't know why, please post it on Piazza and that way everyone can see it. Right? Don't email Prashant and I directly because we don't want to answer it, you know, all these individual emails. Hopefully someone can find, you know, if you have the same problem as somebody else, you may be able to find the solution on Piazza rather than waiting for us to respond, okay? Now, if you have any non-project questions, like you're, you, you're sick and you, you can't make the midterm or something like that, then just email me directly and I'll take care of it, okay? So any questions about the ex expectations of the course? None, all you're in love with it. Okay, great, awesome. All right, so uh, let's talk about the history of databases. Um, so this talk is a combination of two papers. Uh, they're both on the website. And obviously, this is the first class that they're not assigned. The first paper is from Mike Stonebreaker. Um, he's like the godfather, one of the godfathers of databases, one of my advisors when I was in grad school. Um, it's a paper he wrote called What Goes Around Comes Around. Um, it's a little old now. It's from 2006. And it's a, it was an introduction to uh, this thing called the Red Book, which is a compilation of fa famous database, database papers. And his, his, his paper basically covers the, the history of databases up until 2006. And he covers uh, all the major trends that we'll talk about here. And then the second paper is a paper that I wrote with a industry analyst in London uh, named Matt Aslett. It's called What's Really New with New SQL. 
And this covers databases up until uh, 2016. So it sort of picks up where Mike left off and then covers up until 2016. Okay? And there's actually some stuff that has, has changed the last two years since then, um, some major trends that I'll, I'll discuss at the end. Okay? So the main thing that Mike says in, in his paper, the what goes, goes around comes around, is that a lot of the database issues that people were dealing with from way back in the day, like in the 1960s, 1970s, when people were building the first data management systems, a lot of these issues are still relevant today. And what has changed mostly is that the, the scale of the problems are much different. Right? They're much larger. There's more, there's more computers connected to the internet. There's online applications, right? There's, there's way more people you have to deal with, way more, way, way more uh, data you have to deal with. Um, and from a system standpoint, we still have this you know, major trade-off between disk and RAM and CPU scheduling and CPU speeds and things like that. So a lot of the things that, that, that people dealt with in the 1970s, 1980s, when they were building the first data management systems, we still have to deal with today. It's just the, the landscape has changed. Right? But, but the, the core concept of the fundamental problem is still the same. And in particular, uh, the, you know, there was this, a trend for a while, this debate where it was like SQL versus NoSQL, right? Google came out with these NoSQL systems in, in the 2000s, like Bigtable, and they said, well, you don't want to use SQL, you don't need transactions, you don't want to use joins, um, and you don't want to use SQL at all. And then everyone sort of jumped on that bandwagon and started building these, all these NoSQL systems. This argument about, or this, this, you know, compare and contrast between these two types of systems is actually exactly the same debate that they had in the 1970s when they were dealing with the relational model versus the network model, or Codasil. Who here knows what Codasil or has heard of Codasil before? Nobody. It's expected, right? Uh, who, here, who here knows what COBOL is? Few of you. Okay. So we'll, we'll cover this, right? So back then, people were saying the relational model was a bad idea in the same way that the NoSQL guys were saying, right? And they would say, no, no, you don't use the relational model. You want to use the Codasil model, the network model. And then the relational guys were saying, no, no, SQL is what you want to use. You want to declare the language. You want to have your database have this nice relational abstract, abstraction. Um, and the fact that you know, none of you guys have ever heard of Codasil tells you, you know, who, who won that debate. And now when you look at the SQL versus NoSQL, you know, some of the, you know, the NoSQL guys, they had some good ideas, but with the uh, exception of only a few of them, those, those systems either went under or they've added SQL support. Or make things that look like a relational database system. So again, we're seeing this kind of same thing in the history where people are repeating themselves. Right? The same debate we had back here, but then we had maybe you know 10 years ago, and SQL and relational model won again. So let's go back to the very beginning. So the first database management system, at least purported to be one of the first, was a system called IDS out of uh, General Electric. Um, so this was developed internally at GE to help with their sort of manufacturing processes, and then they ended up spinning it off or selling it as a uh, as, as software to other companies outside of GE. So one of the first companies was um, a major lumber company uh, somewhere in like Seattle, and they ended up buying you know buying a very expensive machine from GE, they bought the software, and they sort of deployed one of the first major database systems uh, in that time. So GE had this weird thing or philosophy where if they couldn't be the number one or number two in a particular uh, segment of the market, they didn't want to be in that market at all. So when they had a computing division, they realized that they were, you know, they were not even in the top 10 compared to IBM and all the other ones that were out there. So they decided to sell off their computing division to a company called Honeywell, and um, then Honeywell went forth and sort of was promoting this uh, IDS system. So the two key things about IDS is that it follows a network data model, which I'll explain what that is in a second, and then it supports what are called tuple at a time queries. So if you know SQL, right, SQL is based on uh, bag algebra, where you can write a single query and that can process multiple queries at the same time, or multiple tuples at the same time. In, uh, in IDS, you essentially write these for loops that would iterate over one tuple at a time and do whatever operation you needed to do on it. And then once you were done that operation, you would then go, you know, loop back around the loop and then operate on the next tuple. 
So the main proponent of IDS, and one of the main guys that was designing it was this guy, uh, Charles Bachman. Uh, he won the Tony Award for this early work in databases in like 1973. And so again, he was the main guy pushing that we should use Codasil, we should use the network data model. The relational model is a bad idea. And so he helped build IDS, and then he left uh, Honeywell in the early 1970s and went to a company called Killane Databases, and he helped build another system that was based on the network model called IDMS. So IDS, I don't know if it's still around, uh, but IDMS, you still can buy it, right? You would, if you're a new startup, you would obviously wouldn't want to use this system, right? You want to use something more modern, but there's enough legacy systems out there that are, that are probably still using this. So what does the, data, the, 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 the network data model look like? So let's say that I have a database where I want to keep track of the, the supply database of what, of what parts different vendors are, are supplying, right? And so the way you would model this is that you have these sets, and these sets are connected together with these membership sets. So if you, if you have a supplier, the, the, the company that's going to sell a particular product, right, they would have a, a company name, uh, what city or state they're located in, and then it would be connected together with the supply um, uh, set through this supplies uh, cross-reference set. And so you'd have to write these for loops that would iterate over every entry in here, then do a lookup in here, and then every entry in this, then you do a lookup in here. And then say, you know, let's say for, you know, for every particular supplier, what is the part they're actually supplying? Your for loop has to keep going down with another nested for loop to say what, what this thing's being supplied by what part, right? And so you'd have to write these programs that would have to manually navigate these multi-dimensional networks, right? There was no SQL, there was no sort of declarative language to actually do this. You have to write, this was done in COBOL, which is an early programming language. You have to write literally the for loops to iterate over these data structures and do it yourself, right? And so when you started having really complex, uh, you know, queries, this became really difficult to do. So complex queries are real, a big problem with this. And then the other problem that we had, at least in the early days, was that this database was easily corrupted. So if you lost, say, one of these 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 membership sets, then you got the then you 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 were disconnected from uh, the the supplier and supplies. You had no way to combine these back together because the 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 reference information says that this supplier supplies this this supply entry is stored here. So if you lost this this record or lost this table or collection, then the whole database got corrupted. Right. So another major system in the 1960s was this thing called IMS or IBM's Information Systems. <coughs> so this was the system that IBM helped develop uh, on, on, on the behalf of NASA. It was called before it was called NASA, but it was part of the, the Apollo Moon mission, right? Because they were building this really, you know, really expensive, really large rocket to take people up to the moon, and they needed a way to keep track of all the different parts they had to buy from the different vendors to put their thing together. So I didn't help build, build this database. And so IMS is still around today. You still can buy it. Uh, it's, I've heard rumors that it's still the number one bestseller or it's the number one money maker for IBM because there's a lot of companies that set the system up in the 1970s on their legacy you know, applications and they don't want to switch off it, right? So IMS uses what's called a hierarchical data model and I'll explain what that is in the next slide. Um, it has, has a programmer-defined physical storage format. So what that means is that, if, say you have a, uh, you have a table, um, and you, you have to define when you load that table, you have to tell the data system what data structure to use. Should you use a hash table, or should you use a, a B plus tree, or an index, or a tree-based tree index? And then what happens is, based on what data structure you, you choose, the, the, the database system then exposes to you <laughs> different uh, a different programming interface so if you say i'm going to load my table and use a tree then you can do range queries on it right but if you load your table as a as a hash table and you realize oh i need to do range queries you can't tell the data system go ahead and, and modify it you have to dump the, the table out then load it back in as a tree right and the same thing we had with the network data model in the hierarchical data model it's a it's a two point at a time interface, right? You write these nest of for loops to iterate over you know one collection to the next, one table to the next, and find all the entries you're looking for. So let's look at an example here. So let's say I have uh, my schema is a supplier and a part. Um, 
when I actually now store this inside of IMS, I would have one table instance for, uh, for the supplier entries, but then I would have to have separate tables for every single uh, part that was being supplied by a supplier. As the, everything, each of these would be stored as, as, as a separate data structure. And right? so the issue here is that you're going to end up duplicating data, right? So I have two suppliers that are supplying batteries, and now I'm duplicating the, the part name batteries here, right? So there's a lot of duplicate data in this model. And then there's no data independence. So remember I said, if you, can, you have to define what the data structure is ahead of time, and if you realize you need to use it a different way, then you have to go dump the data out and put it back in, right? Because there's no, the data system isn't hiding from you how the data is actually being stored. Right, so the thing of this, when you program in Python, right, you can, you can make a, you make a dict, you make a uh, list, and you know what the, the data structure actually is because you program to it. It's essentially the, the, same, the same, same idea here. So now, in the 1970s, there was this guy named Ted Cott. Um, he was at IBM Research in, in, in New York. And he was basically walking around IBM. And he wasn't a programmer, he was a mathematician. He's walking around IBM and he saw all these IBM programmers spending their time rewriting their IMS and Codasail programs uh, over and over again. Right? Anytime you, you're, the schema of your database changed, you had to go back and change your application. Right? Like you had to say, if I add a new column, I had to you know, modify the code so that they can deal with the fact that there's now a new column in any tool that, that I access. Right? So he basically realized, wow, this is a huge waste of man hours or a huge waste of time to make these changes over and over again. A better idea is that we had an abstraction that said uh, that just we just told the data system what our data looks like um, at a logical level, and then we didn't care about how it was actually being stored. And then we can write programs against that logical view of our database. And if it if the physical layer changes, we don't have to change our programs. So that is the high level idea of the relational model. And so. In his seminal paper, he has sort of three key ideas, and they're all sort of related to this, this abstraction idea, that you're going to that the data is going to store all the, the collections of data in simple data structures. He called them relations in, in sort of vernacular parlance now. We say, uh, we say tables, the same thing. And then the physical storage of these actual tables or relations will be left up to the database system. It can decide what the right layout is, what, 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 what physical device to store things on. And then the... Made, another major difference between the other two models is that you're going to access this, these tables or these relations through a high-level language, which now we know is SQL. At the time, there wasn't SQL. Um, and then, again, he's a mathematician, so he proposed a sort of relational algebra or relational calculus to do this. And it's only until later that people actually try to make a programming language like SQL or Quell based on this. So again, this should be all uh, familiar with anybody in that took the intro class. Right? I have a supplier, and I have a supply, and then these are joined together through a uh, foreign keys, and that allows me to get up into the, uh, the part if I need to. Right? I don't have to write these for loops. I don't have to traverse the, uh, the data structure manually. I'm going to write SQL and let the data system figure out how to do that. So Ted Codd writes this seminal paper in 1970 that lays out exactly how to do what the relational model is for, for a data system. Um, but as I said, he was a mathematician, not a programmer. So it's not like he then sat, sat down and tried to actually implement it. So when this paper came out, a bunch of people in, uh, saw it and said, we should try to do the same thing. Right? So the, in the early 1970s, there were sort of three main groups trying to build the first relational database management system. So the first two were uh, System R at IBM Research in San Jose, and then uh, at, at Berkeley, like Stonebreaker led a team that built a system called Ingress. Um, a little bit later on, uh, this guy Larry Ellison came along, and he sort of caught wind of what was what was happening at IBM and Berkeley. And thought something was you know kind of cool here. So then he went off and started building his own uh, his own relational database system as well. And he essentially was copying what the IBM guys were doing, right? Uh, if, you, if you read the uh, nulls or the, the, the oral histories of the early system R developers at IBM, they talk about how Larry Ellison would call them on the phone and be like, hey, look, if you, if you, if you give your data system this, this, this sequence, what's the error code? 
right? And he again go program the exact same thing. Right? <laughs> uh, and of course, he's now whatever the he used to be the fifth richest man. I think he went down last month. He might be the seventh or eighth, whatever. Um, so Jim Gray, somebody we're, we're talking about a lot through the semester. He was an early pioneer in databases. He won the, he won the Turing Award in 1996 for this. Uh, Sternberger won the Turing Award a few years ago for in, for databases. And Larry Ellison again is is very rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these early systems prove that you could build a relational database system and have it scale. And the it, they showed that the code of steel model was was insufficient. They showed that hierarchical model was was not what you wanted to do. That this was the right way to go. And the relational model really took off in the 1980s uh, because now outside of just the, the three systems I talked about before, there was now a bunch of other what I call enterprise relational database systems that, that came on the market, right? So IBM never actually commercialized system R. They ended up taking some bits of it and pieces of it and put it into to different versions of DB2. Um, but they came out in 1983 with a, with a brand new data system called DB2. And they said, this is our, this is our relational database system. This is what we're going to promote going forward. And so in the 1970s, it wasn't clear that SQL was going to be the, the de facto language for relational database systems. Like the IBM guys invented SQL, but Stonebreaker had this, this language called Quell that he invented at Berkeley. He claims it's better than SQL. I disagree. Um, but, and of course, Oracle copied IBM, so he had, they had SQL too. So when IBM came out with DB2 in 1983, they said, here's our relational database system. It supports SQL. Oracle's like, hey, look at this. We're, we're right here. We have another data system that also supports SQL, right? Uh, the Ingress guys added, added SQL a little bit later. Um, depending who you talk to, you know, you could argue that Oracle won because they had SQL and Ingress lost because they had Quell. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, but in addition to DB2, Ingress, and Oracle, there's a bunch of other enterprise relational data systems that came, that came out on the market uh, around the same time. So this clearly was the point where the, the, it became obvious to everyone that the, the relational model and SQL were the way, way to go. Um, so most of these systems, actually all these systems are still available today. Um, Teradata is still a major company. Um, they had one of the first database uh, warehouse appliances uh, came out in the 1980s. Interbase uh, was developed by DEC um, it was one of the first early MPCC systems. Uh, that has now been open sourced as Firebird. But you still can get a commercial version of Interbase. I don't know how much of the code is still the same, but there's some company that bought whatever Interbase was from Borland in the 1990s, and, and now they market it as an embedded database. But it's, my understanding is the legacy was from the original system of the 1980s. Sybase got bought by SAP. Performance got bought by IBM. So of these up, up here, the only ones that are still considered to be you know, state of the art are still being uh, actively developed will be DB2, Oracle, and Teradata. HP bought, um, or TAM got bought by DEC, got bought by Compaq, got bought by HP, and even though this is on video, I'll say it. HP is the place where you go if you want your database company to die, right? So nonstop SQL was a really cool system. HP basically floundered it. Vertica was another cool system. HP basically, uh, you know, let it die there. Anyway, so another big thing though is that after Stonebreaker, Stonebreaker left Ingress in the early 1980s, like 1984, they went back to Berkeley and started a new database system called Postgres. If you ever want to know what Postgres stands for, it's post Ingress, right? And so he started that project and that's still the, the, the core system that we use today is based on the code that they developed in Berkeley in the 1980s. Actually, the first version of Postgres was actually written in Lisp. They got rid of that, rewrote it in C. Um, and of course, Stormbreaker really loved Quell, so the first version of Postgres in 1980 supported Quell, not SQL. Um, and then in the, the 1990s, that's when they added SQL. There was a movement in the 1980s towards what are called object oriented databases. Um, and the basic argument here was that the relational model was, 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 was a bad idea because it had this impedance mismatch between how people wrote code. Right, you write object-oriented code in C++ or Java or Python, and when you actually try to go store, store those objects in the database, you have to break them up and store them across different tuples in, in different relations. And so this movement came out in the late 1980s and said basically, well, you don't actually want to store things in relations. You, if, you're, if you're writing your code in objects, you should just store things in, as objects, right? 
So there was a couple of these systems that came out, and the basic idea was that they added additional hooks or, or different libraries for their programming languages to allow you to write out objects that are written in memory in the programming language directly out to a database system. Right? Nowadays, we use ORMs, and they're essentially using the same thing, but back then, it, you would have a sort of special proprietary language. So a bunch of these companies uh, are still around. They've been bought by sort of holding companies, so they're still there. They might still make money for legacy applications, but again, no one's actually actively developing new applications based on them. So for some, Object Store are, are two major ones. Mark Logic is something that came out in the 2000s. Uh, it, it's essentially an XML database. I'm only including it here because a lot of the ideas that came out of this movement, the object-oriented databases, end up making it to now into relational databases. So pretty much every major relational database system now supports JSON or XML. Um, and but you know you can do this in the context of SQL. So what does this look like? So say you have some application code and you have a, uh, and you have a class file and we have a student. The student has an ID, name, email, and then a list of phone numbers. So if you had a relational database, you'd have to write the schema like this, where you'd have a student table, and then you have a student phone table that has a foreign key to the student table, because you need to be able to support multiple, uh, multiple phone numbers for a particular student. Right? So now if you want to go, say, store, you store this data in the database, and then you want to instantiate this object in your, in your programming language, in your application code, you essentially have to do a join between these two tables to go suck in all the data you need and then fill, fill these values in. Right? And so the object oriented database guy says, well, again, you're doing a join, you're doing multiple queries to go populate this thing. What you really want to do is just store the data directly as, as it exists in, the, you know, in, your, in your programming language. And so the example I'm showing here is JSON, right? Just again, to bring up Stonebreaker's point, what goes around comes around. JSON databases are essentially the same thing, right? They're making the same argument that you don't want to store things as normalized relations. You want to store them as denormalized collections or denormalized objects, right? So the problem with this is that uh, when you want to start doing really complex things, uh, this becomes really tricky, um, especially because these, these early object-oriented databases did not have a standard programming language, right? They all had these, you know, these, these, these one-off programming languages that were only specific to their, their, their database system. Uh, and so if you want to switch from one system to the next, you have to write your entire application. So these systems never really took off. Again, they're still around, but nobody actually, still, as far as I know, no one is actually working on them and, and is using them other than maintaining existing code um, for these particular regions, re reasons. All right, so then we get to the 1990s. And for better or worse, I'll call these, this the boring days. And it's a bit of a snide comment, but basically if you told somebody in the 1990s that you were gonna get a PC in databases, they'd be like, why, isn't that a solved problem, right? Um, and there wasn't really any major trends that occurred that were fundamentally changing how we view databases or how database systems were being used, right? So the only major events that sort of happened was Microsoft got was was previously uh, reselling Sybase for Windows NT, so they bought a license to it that allowed them to actually modify the code, and they remarketed it as as SQL Server. Um, so the SQL Server that exists today is based on the original Sybase code that they got in the early 1990s, and now SQL Server has diverged so much, like it's, it's no longer in, in, you know, remotely the same. And SQL Server is actually very very good and very state of the art, whereas Sybase has sort of languished. Um, Sybase had a new version that came out last, last year. Um, for the longest time, things were sort of stagnant. MySQL got rewritten as uh, a, a replacement for MSQL, um, and that came out as open source. Postgres, the effort, uh, Stonebreaker went off and formed a new company called Illustra. They got bought by Informix, and then Informix got based and almost went under and, and got bought by IBM. Um, so a bunch of grad students at Berkeley took the original Postgres code that supported Quell, and they added support for SQL, and they put out as the Postgres QL, and that's the version that everyone uses today. It's based on that, that derivative code that the Berkeley guys developed. And all the, although this is not the 1990s, uh, in the early 2000s, Richard Hipp down in North Carolina started SQLite, which is the most widely deployed database in, in the world. It's amazing. As I said, the, thing, you know, the internet was sort of taking off, but it wasn't wasn't really two, 2000s where things got uh, really interesting. So the 2000s come along, more and more people are online, more, pe more and more people are building these web applications that all of a sudden have 
a large number of users, a large number of transactions, a large amount of data. And the, all the big players, the enterprise systems that I showed in the beginning, Sybase, Oracle, Informix, uh, Ingress, and all, and all these guys, they were really heavyweight and really expensive. And they were not able to support the, the, you know, the large number of, of concurrent operations that these web applications needed. And all the open source database systems at this time in the early 2000s, MySQL and Postgres, although they're very, very good now, back then they were lacking a lot of the core features that you would need or expect in a, in, in, in a, in a database system. Like I remember using MySQL 3 back in 1999, before they had NODB, and you had to be careful because they didn't have transactions. You could lose data, right? And that's not good if, if you want to store data. So uh, what ends up, ended up happening was a lot of these major web companies end up writing either their own middleware to scale or shard the open source guys, right? eBay did this with Oracle. Uh, Facebook famously did this with MySQL and still does. Um, or they ended up writing um, writing their own data management system. So Google did this with, with Bigtable, right? And so basically what happened was people were saying the sort of the, the dinosaur or elephant database systems, the enterprise guys were insufficient for, for, for web or internet services, with internet applications, and they had to look to other alternatives. So then in, also in the 2000s, we saw the movement of uh, what would call data warehouses. And so Prior to this, the enterprise systems were considered jack of all trades, right? You could do transactions on them, you could do analytics, although analytics back then wasn't that complicated as, as, as we know it now. Um, and so what, they, what, what came out was people said, well, actually what you really wanna do, rather than having a system that tries to be everything for everyone and sort of do a half-assed job for all, this thing, all these different things, what you actually wanna build are these special purpose database systems that are really, really good at doing one particular class of applications or one particular type of workload and then uh, have separate systems that can handle other things. So you have one system that can handle OTP system, OTP workloads or operational workloads, and then one system that can handle the OLAP analytical queries. So this really came into prominence in the 2000s with the rise of the data warehouses. So these are systems like, like Netiza, ParkSale, MonadyB, Greenplum, DataLegro, and Vertica. Um, all these systems, except for, I think DataLegro got bought by Microsoft, and I think that got killed. ParkSale, they ended up turning into Redshift, that Amazon uses, or they're, re they're rewriting that now. The Teza got bought by IBM, that's still available. Greenplum is now open source, got bought by EMC, who then uh, spun off Pivotal, and that's actually now open source and available. And then Vertica, as I say, got bought by HP and sort of languished. But supposedly there's now a separate company that, that is running it, it's getting better. And then ModiB is actually an open source academic system out of uh, Europe that's actually pretty good, or really good. It's good. Uh, <laughs> And it's, it's still available today. It's one of the early columns for it. So the key characteristics of all these sort of systems that came out over this time is that they were all distributed, right? All of the enterprise systems I showed before were all single node systems. Um, for analytics, you want to be able to, you don't want to, you don't worry about transactions. So you don't worry about network connections and maintaining consistency across them. You want to worry about scaling out your query across multiple machines and multiple disks and running as fast as possible. All of these systems were, were, were relational and support SQL. And then unfortunately, back then, all of these were, except for mode ADV, were closed source. Greenplum has since open source, but all these other ones, uh, the commercial guys are still closed source. But most of these systems were closed source back then, and because there was a lot of money to be made in having a good data warehouse system. So then one of the other key thing too, we'll discuss during the semester, about these data warehouses is they use, a, there were column stores or use the decomposition storage model. And that contrasts from the enterprise systems from the 1980s which, or even in the 1990s where everybody was with row stores. For analytical workloads that these guys were targeting, a column store is much, much better. Then in the late 2000s, we saw the rise of the NoSQL movement. And again, these, these were operational databases that were worried about ingesting uh, data very quickly from, from from your, from your application, from your users, and being able to service them uh, with, with low latency. So the major trends from all these systems is that they touted themselves as being schemaless or schema last. So unlike in a relational model, we have to define the create table before you're actually able to store any data into it. In a lot of these early NoSQL systems, you just take your JSON object and shove it right in. It didn't check anything, right? 
Uh, and you didn't have to worry about you know, defining what your table is going to look like ahead of time. You just start a storing data and, and, and let, let it go. Uh, a lot of these were non-relational. Non so then you have the document data model, which, as I showed before, in, in the JSON example, it looks a lot like the object-oriented databases from the 1980s, um, or key value stores, or RAF stores, or other things. They didn't support transactions. They didn't support joins. They had these custom APIs instead of supporting SQL, hence the NoSQL moniker. And then well, the nice thing about these guys is that they're usually, they were usually open source, um, with the exception of, I think, Oracle NoSQL, which I think is based off BerkeleyDB. And then Google Bigtable and DynamoDB, all of these are, are open source, which is kind of nice. So now the big thing actually is that uh, they claim NoSQL does, does not mean not SQL, it means not only SQL. So a lot of these systems, uh, these Cassandra, HBase, um, Mongo told me they're never going to support SQL, but they might change that. Uh, a lot of these systems actually do support some dialect of SQL on top of it. And in particular, Cassandra, they make it look a lot like the relational model. Then in early 2010s, uh, this is a movement that I was involved in when I was in graduate school. Uh, we saw the rise of new SQL systems. Um, and new SQL systems were basically, the, they were operational data stores like the, the NoSQL guys. I mean, they were worried about transactional workloads, OTP workloads. Um, but then rather than giving up ACID and giving up SQL, they just had a modern architecture to allow them to scale out and get uh, high throughput and low latency. Um, so there were, all of these were relational and, and supported SQL. All of these were, uh, for the most part, distributed. Um, and unfortunately, usually these things were closed source, with the exception of being HDOR and BoltDB. Um, and this is GenFire. I think that's open source, too. But yeah, all of these are closed source. Um, and so again, the idea here was that these systems basically said, well, if you want the scalability you want in a NoSQL system, you don't have to give up transactions. You don't have to give up SQL. Right? Um, and that's their, that was their, their sort of main selling point. Most of these systems I think I'm showing here are still available. Yes. This is Spanner. Um, Pivotal, I think, got divested by Pivotal, or Gemfire got divested by Pivotal. And I don't, I don't know whether, whether just one DB is still, still, still in the market. All right. So then now, the, where we're at now, so this is sort of up until 2015, 2016. So where we're at now in history is that we're seeing three major trends. The first is that we're seeing the rise of what are called hybrid systems or HTAP systems, hybrid transactional analytical processing systems. So unlike before where I said in the 2000s, people recognize that you want to have specialized systems where you say, I have my OLTP system here, my OLAP system there. Uh, what people actually want to, do, want to do now is have a single database instance support both fast transactions and complex analytics all together without having to deploy you know, multiple, uh, multiple uh, different vendors or different services. So the idea is that you want to support fast OLTP, just like a new SQL system, but then all the complex queries you can do in a specialized data warehouse. So most of these are distributed and share nothing. All of them support uh, the relational model and SQL. And then it's a combination of whether some of them are open source versus closed source. So Splice Machine, Peloton, which is our system, and Snappy are all open source, and the rest of are, are closed source. All right? The other thing we see now is the rise of cloud-based databases. So we all, always sort of had uh, cloud vendors offer database as a service. Like an Amazon, you can get RDS, you can get a single node Amazon instance. Um, basically what they did was they just took, you know, these vendors basically took existing database systems, like Postgres and, and MySQL, and they just plopped it on the VM and set it up and configured it for you. But internally, the architecture was essentially the same thing you would have if you ran it on-premise on, you know, on, on your local machine. So the trend now is that people have been developing database systems that are explicitly designed to run in a shared disk cloud environment. I mean, they, the, the, the database system is, is aware that it's running in a virtualized environment in the cloud and doesn't assume that it has exclusive access to all the data or all, all the resources that it's using. So Snowflake, again, is, is a sponsor for the class. They're probably one of the most prominent OLAP cloud-based databases. Fauna is a uh, commercialized version of the Calvin system. And then Amazon has a bunch of systems like Redshift and Aurora that, that assume this. Zeroround was an Israeli uh, cloud-based database that went under 2013, but they were pretty early in this area. Microsoft put out Cosmos DB last year or two years ago, and then Spanner is, is available from, from Google. And again, the big thing here is that, again, you don't, it's not just taking existing code and just running it in a VM. You actually make it work for the cloud environment, right? So in the case of Amazon, 
they have it know in, in, for Aurora, they know that they're writing data to EBS and they can do some things to avoid having extra redundancies and, and get better performance. So where we're at now in the end of, the, uh, of this decade is that we're seeing way, way more database systems, right? And so I, again, I'm keeping track of them in my database of databases. Uh, we're seeing all sorts of different databases to solve, solve, solve all different types of problems. So we have shared disk databases, we have embedded databases, time series databases, multimodal databases, the big trend as of last year, and blockchain databases, right? Um, so this is just an example of the different uh, of the, the different companies that I'm aware of that are, are in this space. Right? It's a lot of different things. And so in this case here, not all of them are supporting SQL, not all of them are supporting transactions and things we care about because they're not trying to solve those particular problems. Um, it's just again to show you that you know even though databases is an old problem, there's still a lot of interest in this area. Like Oracle has not solved this. Right? If Oracle solved the problem, you wouldn't have all these companies uh, starting up and, and trying out different things. Okay. You're good. Okay. Um, question: Yes. Did the last database have something related to bitcoins? What's the question, sorry? Does the last database have something related to Bitcoins? Blockchain DB messes? Yeah, I just uh, so that's big chain DB. Um, they have, no, it's, 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 the blockchain isn't specific to oh. a isn't specific to a to, to Bitcoin, right? It's a distributed ledger where you don't trust your the the, the, the members of the network. Right? We're not gonna cover blockchains and stuff. Okay. okay. Yes. Is that a Decentralized DBMS? DB and your question is, is, blockchain, is Big Chain DB a decentralized database? Yeah. I actually I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I think they just announced like last month or so. Any other questions? Okay. So what are my parting thoughts? Um, the main thing I want you to get away from this history is that uh, the innovations in databases both come from academia and industry. So one of the hard things about being a database researcher is that not only am I competing with other academics at other universities, both in the U.S. and abroad, uh, and not only do I have to compete against uh, the big companies, the Oracle, Amazons, IBMs, Microsofts, I also have to compete against all these, these startups that are putting out their own systems, their own ideas. So there's a lot of different things that you have to be aware of uh, if you want to work in this space. So it's often the case that there's a lot of good ideas that first start in academia, but you know, because of limited resources, a limited time, they write the paper about what they did and that don't actually see it all the way through in, in the context of a real system. And it's not until a little bit later on will a commercial company actually pick up the idea and uh, you see whether it actually makes sense. You know, so Fawn is a good example of this. The Calvin paper came out in 2012, 2013, and then Fawn and DB started, I think, one or two years ago, they actually tried to commercialize the idea there. So in the 1970s, 1980s, IBM was definitely the vanguard. Def IBM was definitely the leader in, in databases, right? Uh, I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, I definitely think that Google and Amazon and Microsoft are doing some really interesting things and their systems are very state of the art. Um, and then again, some, some open source systems are doing some, some interesting things that are, that, are, that are cool as well. MemSQL, uh, the Hyper guys at Germany, and then um, the Snowflake as well. And my last comment is that as we'll see throughout the semester, Oracle borrows ideas from, every, from anybody. Uh, and usually what happens is the a startup or another company will come out with an idea, and then you'll see it come out in Oracle five years later, right? Um, and I'm not saying that it's like, oh, Oracle's slow. I mean, in their case, they're the most successful in this company. Uh, they have a lot of customers, so you just can't have uh, you know, a rogue employee in the basement write some feature and put it out there. They go through a long testing process, right? Is that correct? He says yes, okay. Uh, our friend here actually worked in Oracle, okay. Um, the other major thing is that I think the relational model has definitely won for operational databases, <coughs> right? Uh, there's like so much inertia around uh, uh, SQL and uh, relational databases that it'd be hard pressed to come along and say, hey, I have a new, I have a new data model, I have a new API. Uh, <coughs> Because it's going to be hard for you to port their existing applications and to, to use that. <coughs> for, um, for analytical workloads or analytical databases, certainly SQL is very prevalent. Uh, where the relational model falls apart is when you want to start doing uh, machine learning 
for anything that, that has to operate on arrays. Um, and although there's not very many array databases, there'll be more in the future. And I suspect that the relational model will have to adapt or have problems uh, dealing with this workload later on. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so next class, uh, we will discuss, start talking, you know, you know getting to the, the, the material in the course. We're going to do a comparison between disk based databases and in memory databases. And again, this course is entirely based on in memory databases. Um, I'll finish off with a discussion of project one at the very end. And then, as a reminder, the first reading assignment for the course will be due on uh, Monday at 12 p.m. Again, there's a Google form online. You just go put your paragraph in there and submit that. Uh, I won't accept anything after 12, 12 p.m. Everything will be considered late. And then I'll send a reminder out on, on Piazza, but there'll be a recit recitation on how to do project one on January 23rd, Tuesday uh, at 5 p.m. on the night floor. Okay? All right, guys. See you on Monday. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker Rhymes I create rotate at a rate too quick To duplicate, fill a breeze, have a skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight When I'm in flight, then we ignite Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turn with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off, with St. Ives <laughs>